And greetings to you. Joe Rubenstein here, producer and host of Real Time 1960s. I want to thank you very much for joining me today for episode 14 of this Portal into the Past, where I document the 60s in real time with podcasts like this, with our retro style news reports of 60 years ago, and of course our daily timeline. And you can find all that content and more on our website, realtime1960s.com as we continue our examination of stories from 1961 uh, that kind of fell through the cracks of my coverage last year. Uh, So tonight, part one of a two-part episode on sports, my personal list of the top six individual performances that year. I'll do three tonight and three next time, and that'll be a wrap on this mini-series on 61. So without further ado, 1961, The Athletes, right now. So let's start with basketball and a question, the great question, on the minds of NBA players, coaches, and fans in 1961. How in the world do you guard Wilt Chamberlain, the seven foot one center uh, for the Philadelphia Warriors? And no one had the answer, uh, with the possible uh, partial exception of the Celtics and their uh, Hall of Fame center, uh, Bill Russell, whose on-court rivalry uh, with Chamberlain is widely regarded as the greatest personal rivalry in NBA history. People point uh, to the rivalry between Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, which I remember, uh, and it was great. And those two uh, met three times in the NBA Finals. But uh, they played different positions and didn't really guard each other whereas uh, Russell and Chamberlain, both centers, uh, most certainly did. And uh, those two played not three, but eight playoff series against each other. And if you include those postseason games, uh, they squared off a grand total of 143 times. And uh, even Russell, as great and quick and smart uh, and disciplined as he was, uh, was on the average outscored and out-rebounded by Chamberlain in both the regular season and the playoffs. And that's no knock on Russell, who was incredible and one of the most intensely competitive athletes uh, to ever walk the earth, neurotically so. Uh, He would get so worked up before games, especially before facing guys like Chamberlain, that he would throw up in the locker room. It was a regular thing, so much so uh, that his teammates would actually get worried uh, when it didn't happen. Like, uh, Bill, are you okay? I didn't hear you throw up today, you know, but it's, it's a tribute to Chamberlain's dominance uh, that Russell, despite uh, getting the short end on those stats that I mentioned, uh, was really the only center uh, able to mount a somewhat effective defense against uh, Chamberlain in his prime. And when you talk about Chamberlain's prime, the legendary uh, 1961-62 season on which we will focus uh, was the prime season of his prime years. His stats that season, just his third in the NBA, he'd played uh, one year with the Harlem Globetrotters after college. Uh, But the stats in 61-62 are ludicrous and show the kind of uh, separation from his peers uh, that you see when you look at uh, Babe Ruth's stats from the 1920s. Of course, uh, this was the season that included uh, Chamberlain's 100 points in a single game effort against, uh, who else? The Knicks, everyone's favorite patsy. On uh, March 2nd, 1962, a record similar to Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak in 1941 that's so unlikely uh, to ever be broken that you might as well call it unbreakable. Now, a major factor in that game, which sadly, uh, criminally, Uh, was not televised, and the only audio that survives is a barely audible uh, radio broadcast of the latter part of the fourth quarter. The NBA at that point uh, was still not viewed as a major sports league and really struggled uh, to compete against college basketball. Uh, The attendance at that 100-point game was only 4,124, which actually was not that bad for a regular season game in 1962. And despite the fact that the Knicks were involved, uh, not one New York sports writer was at that game. It just wasn't covered. Uh, But a major factor in that 100-point effort uh, was Chamberlain's uncharacteristic excellence at the free throw line, hitting 28 of 32. Uh, So almost a third of those 100 points he earned at the line. And I say uh, uncharacteristic. It's a funny thing. He'd actually been a good free throw shooter at the University of Kansas, but as time progressed, his skills there really deteriorated, and Chamberlain finished his pro career uh, with an atrocious uh, 51.1% success rate at the line. That's the third lowest career free throw percentage in NBA history, and he acknowledged more than once that he was just a psycho case in that department, which I kind of understand. I mean, think about of the rough and tumble of regular basketball action, you know, where everything is motion 
And then uh, with the free throws, uh, everything stops. It gets uh, comparatively quiet. Uh, the attention of everyone in the building is focused exclusively on you. You're not being guarded. So there's no real excuse not to make it uh, the vast majority of the time. And then, of course, failure breeds more failure, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, so the whole thing just did a number on his head. And everybody and his brother had a suggestion. Shoot him one-handed, uh, shoot him as bank shots, uh, shoot him as his famous uh, fadeaway jumper, which would have looked really weird. Uh, actually, one good suggestion was that he shoot them underhanded. And in that 100-point game, that's how he did it. Uh, but he later said he was just too embarrassed uh, by the underhand technique to continue using it, uh, even though it did give him much better results. But 100 points in a single game, is it, it just doesn't seem conceivable. I mean, think about the hundreds, thousands, thousands of games where a team doesn't score 100 points. And in the 60 years since that game, which Chamberlain uh, played on zero sleep and with a hangover, uh, the closest anyone's ever come to that 100-point effort is Kobe Bryant, who scored 81 uh, in a game in 2006. A far cry. And he, of course, uh, had the benefit of three-point shooting, which was not uh, introduced into the NBA until 1979. But it wasn't just that game in 61-62. You know, when a player in the NBA drops 50 points in a single game, that's special, right? That, that's the lead story on ESPN that night. That season, Chamberlain averaged, averaged 50.4 points per game. Unthinkable. And in one eight-day stretch in mid-January of 62, uh, Chamberlain played three games in a row in which he scored at least 63 points. And with his 4,029 uh, total points that season, uh, he's still the only player to ever break the 4,000-point barrier. Uh, the only other guy to break the 3,000-point barrier is Michael Jordan, which he barely did uh, in the 86-87 season uh, with 3,041, again, uh, with the three-point shot at his disposal. So, as I said, you can see the separation. And beyond the season we're discussing, uh, Chamberlain broke the 3,000-point barrier uh, in both 61 and 63, and he came within 52 points of doing it again in 64. But getting back to my initial question of how to guard this man, uh, the problem with double or triple teaming him, uh, and in college he'd actually been quadruple teamed occasionally, uh, was that by 61-62, uh, the Warriors had enough supporting talent to make you pay for that strategy. It was a good team. In fact, in the Eastern Division Finals that season, uh, they came within a whisker of beating a Celtics team that uh, both Bill Russell and Bob Cousy called the greatest of all time. That series went to seven games, with Boston winning it on a last-second jump shot uh, from Sam Jones. Uh, Chamberlain would have to wait until 1967 uh, to earn his first ring, and he did so uh, as a member of a different Philadelphia team, the 76ers, uh, who in the finals that year defeated Wilt's former team, the Warriors, who had moved uh, to San Francisco. And he would win a second ring with the Lakers in 1972. But what an impact uh, this one man had on the game. He was directly responsible uh, for several rule changes in the NBA, including uh, widening the lane to try and keep the big men farther away from the hoop, uh, the offensive goaltending rule, which prevented him and others from deflecting teammate shots into the basket, uh, which early on he did at will uh, with his incredible skill at establishing position. I say skill, he did it with brute force. I'll tell you a couple stories about his physical strength uh, in a minute. But another incredible stat, uh, considering how physical a player uh, Chamberlain was in the post, was the fact that he never, not once, fouled out of a game in his entire 14-year NBA career. And he was fouled all the time, hard. They allowed stuff back then, including fighting sometimes, uh, that would get you tossed from a game today in like two seconds, and probably suspended. Uh, but the hard fouls were a constant, to the point uh, where Chamberlain almost quit the NBA after his rookie year. Not because he couldn't take it, uh, but because uh, he was afraid he would lose his cool and actually kill somebody. Uh, Tommy Heinsohn of the Celtics, who got Chamberlain so agitated with his uh, roughhouse tactics in the 1960 playoffs that Chamberlain finally did lose his cool and punch uh, Heinsohn in the mouth. Uh, Tommy Heinsohn later said, quote, at least half the fouls on Chamberlain were hard fouls. He took the most brutal pounding of any player ever. Uh, but tales of Chamberlain's physical strength are legion. When he was with the Globetrotters, they had a routine where the captain, Meadowlark Lemon, who I saw as a kid, my dad took me and my brother to a Nick game. This must have been around 1977-78. Uh, and uh, Meadowlark Lemon and the Globetrotters entertained the crowd at halftime. And I do mean entertained. They were just so talented. Uh, just lit up the garden. Uh, but in this skit uh, back in 1957, 
uh, Meadowlark Lemon would collapse to the ground and Chamberlain would walk over and instead of helping him up, uh, he would pick him up, all 210 pounds of Meadowlark Lemon and uh, throw him several feet high in the air and catch him like a doll. Uh, Lemon always said that Chamberlain uh, was the strongest athlete who ever lived. And when Bob Lanier, a Hall of Fame center for the Detroit Pistons, uh, who was a good 250 pounds, when he was asked at his retirement for the most memorable moment of his career, uh, he said, quote, probably when Wilt Chamberlain lifted me up and moved me like a coffee cup so he could get a favorable position, unquote. Coffee cup, I love that. Uh, But I did want to start this list uh, with Wilt Chamberlain because, again, I'm a little too young to have seen him play. I was about four uh, when he retired in 1973. But I kind of feel like I've seen him play vicariously now since I've been reporting on some of these performances uh, from my timeline. And again, uh, these numbers uh, just had my jaw on the floor. Next up is a pair of baseball players, uh, both of whom wore pinstripes in 1961. Uh, One uh, wore them for his entire career, uh, the other not. And the other, of course, uh, is Roger Maris and his 61 home runs. Uh, Still, to me, the home run king, at least uh, of the 162-game season. Uh, The steroid-fueled performances we saw between 1998 and 2001 uh, from Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, and Barry Bonds. As talented as those three were, and Bonds are certainly one of the best ever, uh, I do not accept those performances as legitimate athletic achievements. I just don't. I see them as a kind of uh, sci-fi freak show uh, fueled by vanity, envy, and greed. And greed, uh, not just on the part of the players, but on the part of Major League Baseball, which at that time uh, swept PEDs under the rug uh, in its desperation to boost uh, ratings and attendance after the disastrous uh, cancellation of the 94 season and part of the 95 season. And by the way, despite those three performances, uh, Maris still holds the American League record for most home runs in a season. Now, as for Maris, I mean, I don't know what I can say about his 61 season that hasn't already been said. Uh, Unlike Babe Ruth, Maris, um, he just didn't have the right personality for the spotlight uh, that breaking that record generated. Uh, He was a good guy, but as a young man, at least, uh, quite sensitive, introverted, uh, a bit of a temper, and he took everything personally. And the truth is, you know, having now read a good deal of the period reporting of that 61 season, it wasn't that bad. Uh, Not as critical of Maris as I was led to believe, at least uh, not in New York. Actually, most of it uh, was quite sympathetic. Now, he did get grief uh, from fans on the road, uh, including some death threats, but that's kind of a different matter and much more common than you might think. Hank Aaron uh, dealt with that uh, to a much greater degree because of his race uh, in the 1970s when he broke uh, Ruth's career home run record. Now, as I'm sure you know, uh, there was this big controversy surrounding Commissioner Ford Frick's uh, declaration in the summer of 61 uh, that if Maris or Mantle were to break the record of 60 home runs in a season, which Ruth did in 1927, it would be listed as a separate record from that of Ruth's. Uh, There was and is no asterisk in baseball's record books. That's a myth. In fact, Major League Baseball in 1961 had no official record book. It does now, but it didn't then. And so therefore, it had no authority to insert an asterisk, even if it wanted to. Now, as far as Frick's point uh, that Ruth and Maris's records uh, should be viewed separately, uh, I agree. I mean, to hit 61 homers in 162 games is obviously incredibly impressive. Uh, But it's simply not the same achievement as hitting 60 in 154. It's like comparing the timings of two runners, uh, one of whom ran the 100-yard dash and the other the 98-yard dash. Uh, Having said that, uh, by the end of the 60s, uh, it was Maris and not Ruth who was listed by every prominent uh, baseball record keeper as the single-season record holder, at least until uh, McGuire's kind of bogus achievement in 1998. Now, as for the ongoing, uh, somewhat tedious argument of whether Maris should or should not be in the Hall of Fame, which he is not, Uh, The argument for yes is obviously the back-to-back MVP seasons in 1960 and 61, uh, the home run record, uh, I would say the three championships, uh, two with the Yankees in 61 and 62, and one with the Cardinals in 67. I'm not sure actually how much uh, the Hall of Fame weighs uh, team accomplishments, if at all. Uh, You know, Ernie Banks never played a postseason game, and he's in the Hall of Fame, so they may not count that as much. Uh, The argument against Maris uh, being in the Hall of Fame uh, is the relative brevity of his peak. He had four all-star seasons from 1959 through 62. Uh, So four great seasons in what overall uh, was a very good but not earth-shattering 12-year career. 
Uh, Maris hit 260 for his career. Uh, he won the Gold Glove once, and he had a grand total of 275 home runs, uh, which is impressive. But there's about 200 players who have more in their careers, the majority of whom are not in the Hall of Fame. So I'm not one who cares at all about the Hall of Fame or any other uh, major awards, whether it's the Academy Awards, the Pulitzer Prize, whatever. Uh, because in the end, one way or another, uh, politics always corrupts the process. I would say now more than ever. So those who deserve to win often don't for what I consider uh, sketchy reasons. Uh, but with Maris, I mean, gun to my head, I would say it's probably correct uh, that he's not in the Hall of Fame. But a hell of a 61 season. But there was another Yankee on the club that year who is in the Hall of Fame, uh, whose performance was every bit as impactful as that of Roger Maris, 10-time All-Star, uh, six-time World Series champion, who in 1961 received the Cy Young Award and uh, the World Series MVP Award. And this is a guy who certainly did enjoy the spotlight in New York, in fact, uh, thrived on it, uh, the chairman of the board, Edward Charles Whitey Ford whose incredible performance in the 61 World Series against the Reds uh, was really just a continuation of his top flight work in the previous uh, World Series. He still has more World Series victories than any other pitcher, 10. Uh, but his signal achievement in 61 was to break another of Babe Ruth's records, the World Series record of 29 and two-thirds consecutive scoreless innings, which uh, Ruth achieved as a pitcher with the Red Sox. I mean, to throw that many consecutive scoreless innings uh, in the regular season is notable. Although, of course, it's been done a number of times. The record, by the way, in the regular season is uh, 59 uh, consecutive scoreless innings pitched by Dodger Oral Hershiser in 1988. But for Ford to do it against the best the National League has to offer, facing guys like Roberto Clemente and Frank Robinson on the world's biggest stage, inning after inning, it really is quite something. And uh, his streak would ultimately reach 33 innings, a World Series record uh, that still stands. And Ford, uh, who was also before my time, he retired in 1967, but studying his approach on the mound, if I had to compare him to someone more recent, someone I did watch uh, with great admiration in the 1990s, it would be a Hall of Famer Greg Maddox, pinpoint control. And like Maddox, Ford did not uh, have an overpowering fastball, as his uh, contemporary Sandy Koufax and Bob Gibson did. But what he did have uh, was superb command of five pitches, uh, which he mixed uh, with devastating effectiveness, uh, constantly keeping hitters off balance. And his performance in 1961 has been somewhat overshadowed historically and at the time by the Maris Mantle uh, home run derby. Uh, so I wanted to kind of uh, give Whitey a boost on this podcast. So there it is, the first three of my top six individual performers of 1961. Wilt Chamberlain, Roger Maris, and Whitey Ford. Next time, I'll cover a legendary uh, football player, a somewhat underappreciated boxer, and another baseball player regarded by many uh, as the greatest of all time. Although for me, uh, that conversation begins and ends uh, with Babe Ruth. Back in a moment. Your feedback is important to us on Twitter, at Realtime1960s, on our Facebook page, or you can email the program, realtime1960s at gmail.com. Really, however you'd like to engage with us, we love engaging with you. And if you'd like to join our family and help us continue to bring you great content, please go to patreon.com slash realtime1960s and subscribe. Don't forget to visit us at realtime1960s.com for our timeline, each and every podcast, links to social media, how to reach us directly, everything you need to know about this portal into the past that we are creating. Thanks so much for joining us. Take care, and I'll see you soon.